to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 1 Timothy. Today in particular, we're going to be talking a great deal about the work and the relationship and the qualifications of elders as found in the Bible. And so if you haven't got your Bible handy, we want to encourage you to locate that, have your Bible handy, as we're going to look to the Word of God as our authority in this study. Friend, we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. And we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area, your hometown, would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be for a Bible study or worship on Sunday morning or Sunday night or for the Wednesday Bible study, I can assure you, you will be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God who are concerned about other people's souls and who want men and women to go by the Bible and thus have a home in heaven with them. And so stop by the Church of Christ in your area. If you'd like to study more, you've got a Bible question, maybe something you've been thinking about salvation or worship or how a Christian should live, a moral question, whatever it may be. You'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down with you, open up the Word of God, and see what He has to say on that matter. Friend, we'd also like to help you in your desire to know God here at The Gospel of Christ. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material free of charge. We have lessons of all the Old Testament books, New Testament books, over 500 lessons total on a wide variety of subjects as well, and they're all available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of it, in fact, today's lesson or any of our lessons, go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a media request form, you can select a digital download and we can send that to you instantaneously, or if you need a hard copy and a CD or DVD, We'll make those available to you as well. And friend, we always encourage folks in a world where it seems like everybody's got a smartphone and life is moving at such a fast pace, check out the Gospel of Christ app, available both in the Apple and Google stores. It's a free app, gives you great updates, notifications, and of course you can access all our material on the app as well. Today we're thinking about the work in the office and the qualifications of elders as found in the Bible. It is God's desire that there be elders in every congregation. Titus 1 verse 5, Acts chapter 14 verse 21 and 22. That's what Paul went around and helped set up elders and he encouraged Timothy and Titus to do the same thing because in God's system of leadership. Every congregation is under the authority of Jesus as head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, but every congregation ought to have elders who in matters of function and in expediency insist that God's word lovingly be followed and that people live in such a way that God would be pleased with their lives. They are shepherds, of our souls. They try to help us get to heaven, Hebrews 13, 17, 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, and they do all that in love by following the true or chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 5, verses 3 through 5. And so let's think for just a few moments today about who's qualified to be an elder and what that work is. Would you look in your Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and let's read the qualifications together in 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse number 1. Paul says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. 
A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall in the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We think about these as qualities, qualifications, characteristics that an individual ought to have, that he ought to meet initially and continue to grow in as a Christian. And so when we think about who can be an elder, let's begin with some basics. In the, in the place of authority, God put men, not women, as elders. How do we know that? He is to be the husband of one night, wife, the father of children. Husband, father, the words he or him all indicate to us that this is a qualification that applies to males, to men in the church. Now, let's, what we're going to do is we're going to think about some negative qualifications, some things he is not to have in his life, and then some positive qualifications, and then some things related to his family as well. What are some things that are to be absent from his life? 1 Timothy 3 verse 3 and Titus 1 verse 7, not given to wine. The note in the American Standard Version says, one who is not ready to quarrel, offer wrong as one in wine, not a brawler. Thus, an elder cannot be one who is addicted to, who imbibes alcohol, or has the disposition of one who does. We know that alcohol can weaken the senses. Proverbs 20, verse 1, He was led astray by wine is not wise. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. We know that drunkenness is definitely condemned in the Bible, but we're talking about people who are leaders. We're talking about people who represent the example, trying to follow the example of Jesus and, and stand before others in a leadership position. And the Bible says they're not to be given to any wine. They are not to drink that because it affects a person and they are not to have the disposition of one who does as well. A second negative qualification, the Bible says they are not to be violent. Again, 1 Timothy 3 verse 3, and Titus 1 verse 7. Thayer's Greek Dictionary defines this word as one who is a bruiser, one who is ready with a blow, a pugnacious, contentious, quarrelsome person. When the Bible says an elder is not to be violent, what is it talking about? An elder cannot be a person who solves his differences with his fist. In dealing with people, and delicate situations, and oftentimes taking the brunt of things. An elder's got to have control of himself and his temper. He cannot be a violent person who blows up, who flies off the handle, who gets up and says things without... No. He's got to be a person who's under control. Am I saying an elder doesn't get mad? That's not the idea. But you've got to have enough self-control that although things will and may make you angry, you don't act in violence or in anger. Thirdly, an elder is not to be a quarrelsome person. 1 Timothy 3 verse 3 says not quarrelsome. While this term is similar in some ways to the ones above, it also suggests that an elder is not always looking to be controversial or argumentative, not just arguing for the sake of arguing, not a quarrelsome person, not that every time something comes up, we got to have a big debate or quarrel about it or fight about it or we got to argue. No, that's not going to foster peace and goodwill and growth inside a congregation. When there is drama and there is controversy and there are people who are always arguing, that's not an environment where people are going to grow spiritually at. And so that doesn't need to be a part of, a, of an elder's life. And then the Bible says, as a negative qualification, that an elder is not to be quick-tempered. Titus 1 verse 7, uh, New King James says, not soon angry. 
An elder must not be hot-headed or quick to fly off the handle and lose his temper when souls are in the balance. Elders need to be cool-headed and in control of themselves and the situation. I've known people and you've known people in your life who were hotheads, who were quick temper, who got angry. They could go from zero to 60 and in the anger and just like that. An elder can't do that. There are going to be times people try to push his buttons. There are going to be times situations really turn your stomach. You've got to be in control of yourself and your temper if you're going to be in the eldership. And then another negative qualification, something he must not possess in his life, mentioned again in 1 Timothy 3 verse 3 and Titus 1 verse 7, not greedy for money. Uh, the New King James and the American Standard Version will translate this as not a lover of money. An elder cannot be a person whose main concern is money. Listen, elders are in the business of saving souls, not in the business of hoarding money. And, and you can see why this would be a problem. With the giving on the first day of the week and the elders being in authority over matters of function and expediency, they would have contact with and control over the funds of the congregation. What if one of them is a lover of money and he's got debt problems? Do you see the temptation there? What if one is a lover of money and money needs to be spent to save the lost? It's harder for that person to let go of it even when it's the right thing. And so someone who's a lover of money is going to have difficulty and should not be in the eldership. And then akin to this idea, a negative qualification found in 1 Timothy 3 verse 3 is, an elder must not be covetous. With this, the idea is broadened. Not, not just to include finances or money, but unlawful desire to possess material possessions, especially maybe that which belongs to another. Let your life be content with such, let your life be without covetousness, Paul would say. Be content with such things as you have. Inside the eldership, you can't be coveting another person's money or wife or home or car or other things. You've got to be an example of someone who is content in every way. And then as it relates to his experience, an elder cannot be a novice. 1 Timothy 3 verse 3, Thayer defines this Greek term neophyte as one newly planted, a new convert, one who recently became a Christian. Vine's dictionary notes that in this passage, it applies to a person who by inexperience is unfitted to act as an overseer in the church. Friend, we are not saying being a new convert's wrong. We are not saying that you should never be a babe in Christ. There's a natural place and time for that. But you wouldn't take a baby in the faith and put them as a shepherd over the congregation. Those two are only going to create problems when you do that. Now, we're not, listen carefully what we're saying here. A novice may not just be a new convert. It's possible for someone who's been in the Lord many years to still be a novice in the faith. How do we know that? Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. The Hebrew writer said, by this time you ought to be teachers. You've been a Christian long enough. You ought to be teaching somebody, yet you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of Christ. You've come to need milk and not solid food. Just because someone has been a Christian 20 or 30 years doesn't mean that's where they are in their faith. And so you don't want someone who is a novice in the faith to be a Christ, to be an elder or a overseer of the Lord's body. And then, of course, his approach. There's a negative qualification of that as well, and it's this. Titus 1 verse 7 says, an elder must not be self-willed. This term means self-pleasing or self-desire. An elder must not be always dominated by self-interest or one who has to demand their own way. This is a really big idea, and I want you to hear what we're saying here. Inside an eldership, and there always is a Plurality, Titus 1, 5, Acts 14, verse 21 and 22, you have to learn to work with other people. And there may be things you feel strongly about in matters of expediency and function that the others may not feel strongly about. 
I've got to learn to get along and go along. I've got to learn that in matters of option and in matters of expediency, I don't have to get my way. Now, friend, I've seen lots of problems, and maybe you have in that area as well. Someone is really convinced of something, so much so that they've got to demand their way, regardless who they hurt or who they push out of the way or who they run over. That can't be the way it is inside the eldership. Not self-willed, God-willed. What God wants, not what we want. Luke chapter 22, verse number 42. All right, let's then think about the positive, the good qualifications that an elder should possess. We saw the things that ought to be out, out of his life that he shouldn't have. What kind of things then does an elder need? Number one, as it relates to his character, 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 and Titus 1 verse 7 says that an elder ought to be blameless. The American Standard Version has without reproach and most Greek dictionaries, Thayer's dictionary would de define this as that which cannot be called into account, uh, unreprovable, unaccused. This term blameless does not carry the idea of sinless, okay? I want you to get that out of your head. Blameless is not sinless for nobody's sinless, right? Hebrews 4.15. Blameless, rather, is one who is a man of honesty, integrity, one who stands above reproach, one who when he does find sin in his life is willing to make that right so that he can't be blamed by God or others. That, that's the idea. Good character, integrity, one who deals with sin in a God-approved way so that he cannot be blamed. Second positive qualification. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 says, an elder must be of good behavior. This term expresses the idea of a, a well-arranged life. Modest, a man living with the proper decorum, a well-ordered life. Guy in Woods described this as one who conforms to acceptable standards and always tries to behave well. We can understand that. We say, man, they've got good behavior. They've got good manners. They know how to behave themselves. They know how to act right, even in difficult situations. A friend, an elder surely has to be one of good behavior for their behavior is being watched as a leader of the congregation. Thirdly, as a positive qualification, Titus 1 verse 8 says, bishops, overseers, elders must be just. The idea here expressed is render to each one due or pass fair judgment on others. An elder must be a person who deals with others fairly, doesn't make a judgment until he's examined all the evidence. He doesn't play favorites. He doesn't put people he's close to above other people. That's not the way it works. Deal with everybody fairly. Examine the evidence. Pass good judgment upon the situation. And then, of course, the idea of holy. Titus 1 verse 8, Thayer's Greek lexicon defines holy as undefiled by sin, free from wickedness. Um, the idea is an elder must be a man who's 100% dedicated to God in every aspect of his life and in the church. Now again, are we saying elders are perfect? No. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we make Him a liar, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all iniquity. And then, of course, as a positive qualification, an elder must be temperate or sober-minded. Both of these terms found in Titus 1.8, 1 Timothy 3.2, express the idea of self-control, having one's passions and desires in control, not being hasty, not being driven by passion, not thinking based on desire, but thinking based on God's will and what's best for the congregation and others. All right, let's talk then about some positive qualifications in the realm of reputation. 1 Timothy 3.7, to be qualified as an elder, one must have a good testimony among those who are outside. A good standing outside the church, a good standing by members in the church, his character, his family, his speech must be inviting by non-members. How does the world see this man? Do they know he's got a good testimony, that he's honest and just and trying to do right? Secondly, he must be given to hospitality. 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, 8. 
Thayer says this word means being generous to, to guest. An elder must be willing to open his home, be inviting, someone who's approachable and helpful. To, how are you going to help people in problems and situations and, and shepherd the flock and help people obey the gospel if you're not a very friendly or hospitable type of person? He's a lover of what is good, anything that's good, good works, good people, good books, good things. He loves that. He wants that to be premier. An elder must be able to teach. One who knows the Word of God, Titus 1.9, 1 Timothy 3.2, and one who is able to teach it, whether that be Bible class, preaching, personal evangelism. There's a, a, a variety of avenues through which he could teach, but in some way, shape, or form, he needs to be teaching, able to teach, apt to teach, ready to teach the gospel to others. All right, then, let's think about his qualifications in the realm of family. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. He is to be the husband of one wife. What does that mean? An elder has to be in a scriptural marriage relationship. He cannot be a bachelor and he cannot be a bigamist. Those two won't work. The, a one-man woman or a one-woman man is kind of the idea of what Paul is getting at there. Remember, death ends marriage, Romans 7, 1 through 4, and divorce. But as we talk about the eldership, he still has to be, have one wife. That's his main focus. Um, if his wife dies, the, 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 the qualification is something that's ongoing. It's a, it's a durative qualification. Continually the husband of one wife. The wife is there to help, as you'll see some mention of that in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And thus, if his wife dies, he's not currently the husband of one wife. If death ends marriage, and it does, then friend, that person, I believe, would be disqualified from serving as an elder because he's no longer, he's not currently the husband of one wife because of the need and the help that the wife would give there. And so a one-man woman and his wife is still alive, working with him to encourage and support him. Secondly, the Bible teaches he has to have faithful or submissive children. 1 Timothy 3 verse 4, Titus 1 verse 6 both issue this as part of the family-related qualification. Now, 1 Timothy 3 4 and Titus 1 6 identifies that as one who rules his own house well. This qualification is defined to ruling his own house well. Paul states that in 1 Timothy 3 as well. I think this helps us understand the boundary and the limitation of this qualification. If an elder, did the elder do what he could as a father and as a parent while his children are in the home to teach them the gospel, to help them learn how to live a good life, to help them be submissive to him and his leadership. Remember, that jurisdiction is only inside his home. Just as elders do not have jurisdiction over another congregation, a friend and a father cannot have jurisdiction outside of his home. And so their behavior in the home while they were under his uh, authority and power as father that would relate to faithful or submissive children under the Father. Now, as you think about this idea, let's talk a little bit about the word children. The question often arises, if a man only has one child, is he qualified? Friend, I'm convinced that that word children can refer to the singular one child as well as it can to two or more children. Uh, in fact, I believe the Scripture teaches the word children applies to anyone with one or more child. Let me illustrate. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 21 with me, verses 5 through 7. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 21, beginning in verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him, and Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. Now watch this. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. The language Sarah uses is plural, children. But they only had one child. After the birth of Isaac, it is said, Sarah had children. The scripture confirms one child is children. Ephesians 6 verse 1, children are to obey their parents. If you only got one child, does that not apply? 
Well, of course not. It applies because children is used in the generic sense to represent one or more children. Imagine it this way. You go into a hospital. There's a long staircase, and it says uh, no children under 10 years old up the staircase. Well, what if you've only got one child and he's 8 years old? Does that mean he can go up? Well, of course not. We understand that word children applies to one or more. Any children is the idea. And so when we think about the qualifications of elders, friend, it's a very serious job and serious responsibility. Let me show you that. Would you look in your Bible to the book of Hebrews? Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And I want you to see what the Bible says about the work and the responsibility of elders. Verse number 7. Remember those who rule over you, who've spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now look at verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And so what an awesome responsibility to be accountable for people's souls. Now friend, I can't make anybody, you can't make anybody, elders can't make anybody, but they can lead. They can be qualified like God wants them to. They can fulfill the duty in the office of an elder in 1 Timothy 3, 1, and, and they can set the standard that all of us ought to try to live by just like the standard of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so for God's church to be conducted like God wants, 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, there needs to be qualified elders in every congregation, Titus 1 verse 5, and we need to love and support and try to do what we can to make their work a joy. They've got enough headache, they're the complaint department enough of the time. Let's do what we can to encourage and help them. We hope you'll join us next time as we're going to study more from the books of 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.